my first year in private practice, and it is a, a very memorable case, but it is a demonstration of that phenomenon I described to you earlier, how a cyst on the ovary will potentially precipitate torsion. And again, because it gets wedged once the ovary torses and then the ovary can't untorse. Pregnancy is also a risk for ovarian torsion for much the same reasons, right? When everything gets packed in there tighter, the chances of an ovary torsing and not untorsing are greater. So the other thing I mentioned was that ovarian cysts in a torsed ovary become ischemic themselves and can be the initial presentation of ovarian torsion with a cystic hemorrhage, right? So they can present with pain from a hemorrhagic cyst, which is really because the ovary and cyst have become ischemic. So that is what happened with this case. So we did the ultrasound initially and our ultrasonographer could not find the ovary. So I got a bunch of images of a right upper quadrant cyst with a clear hemorrhagic level in it. And, uh, and the comment from the ultrasonographer, who was very good, that she could not find the ovary. So we decided to do an MR because the patient's pain was uh, extreme and the uh, cyst was in such an unusual location I couldn't even tell that it was in the ovary, especially because the ovary had not been identified. So we did an MR and I will tell you, it was early in my days, I did a body MR fellowship, but I hadn't dealt specifically with this. And I, uh, I really flailed. I did a really small field of view uh, study on the area that we thought was the ovary, which is there in the right lower quadrant. And it came out, uh, it, it, I picked too small a field of view, and so it came out really fuzzy. You lose so much signal when you go with a real small field of view. It seems like a smart thing to do, but it wasn't and still isn't. So it, I got these fuzzy things, and I couldn't identify that as an ovary. So I opened it up and just did a good old-fashioned SSFSE which minimizes respiratory motion and is a great way to go in uh, emergency MR. And so you can see right there in that right lower quadrant, there is a blackened structure and you can actually see the cortex of the ovary and it extends up the vascular pedicle in such a way that it almost looks like a loop of bowel. But you can see those little peripheral follicles, which are the telltale sign of a torsed ovary. So this one, it was really actually comical when I think back on it because I had to call the obstetrician and say, I think that's a torsed ovary with a hemorrhagic cyst. And she said, well, I'm not taking a 24 week pregnant patient to surgery over your, I think, and so uh, it got really heated where I'm saying, well, you know, I'm doing my best here. And finally I said, take her, it's gotta be an ovarian torsion. So uh, this patient went to surgery. It was three or four in the afternoon. So I went home and I was having dinner with my wife and I sat there and I finally said, I have to go. And I went and I called the floor the moment this patient was returning from surgery. And I got the obstetrician she said, oh yeah, and it was bad. Uh, apparently the tube will get tangled up in these torsions and become ischemic themselves. And when that happens, that ischemia can essentially extend up the tube and involve the friable hypervascular uterus of pregnancy. And that is a hemorrhagic disaster. So she said it was really close. She clamped the tube near the cornua of the uterus. And she said her partner said, well, when are we going to make the move and cut this and tie it off, et cetera? She can't finish her pregnancy with a clamp on her tube. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting uh, anecdote. So there again, the ovary with peripheralized follicles, and you can even see the goo in the hemorrhagic cyst, right? That signal is dependent hemorrhagic products, and then there's the ovary. 
So yeah, we flailed around a lot on this MR and uh, I, I go straight to the large field of view SSFSC. It's gonna give you all the detail you need. And there is one of my rare clinical follow-ups. Uh, the obstetrician was sufficiently impressed that she took a picture of it. So the cyst is on your left and the blackened torsed ovary is on the right there. Pretty impressive. All right, so that is ovarian torsion presenting as a hemorrhagic cyst. And then the other one I wanted to share with you was on that issue of endometriosis and tethering of the bowel. And this is a great case. This actually is not the exact case uh, of the CT that I showed you, but it's almost identical. And that is a phenomenon I've noticed in all of radiology. The first time you see something, you go, whoa, and then thereafter, uh, they become like faces and just pretty routine. And that's what endometriosis of the pelvis on MR has become to me. I just take one look at this and go, look at that tethering. That's endometriosis. All right, so this is a, a great when You've got your T2 FSEs, axial and sagittal. And then on the right, that's a GRE that is showing you bright blood products. Right, so let's look at this in more detail. So look at that tethering. It's truly amazing. All that distortion involving basically ovaries and small bowel. And there's a particularly uh, neat one. So there are two adnexal fluid collections and it's clearly not pure fluid, right? It's not bright enough. And that's just aging hemorrhage products. You've even got a level there in, in the left adnexa. But look at that thing in the cul-de-sac. That is just spectacular. So that's probably a newer one. It's got that, well, actually, it might have aged more, to tell you the truth, because it's got that uh, bright fluid signal and then the dependent hemorrhage products right at the tip of the arrow. You see where I'm uh, talking about is this guy right here. Okay, so he's, we've got that bright fluid and then the hemosiderin, the blood products, uh, dependently, but this little nubbin right here is a focus of active endometrial tissue, and that is what's producing the blood that's collecting there. So that's a, just a spectacular shot of endometriosis involving both ovaries, the bowel, and with a, uh, an endometrial deposit there in the cul-de-sac region. And on the sagittal, you can see that all this cicatricial change is actually sticking these structures to the back of the uterus. And there, uh, remember this patient is supine, right? There is that dependent uh, uh, hematocrit level and that nubbin of active endometrial tissue there. Okay, and again, that stuff in the ovary is probably aging blood products as well because it's not as bright as regular fluid. All right, and then when we did a GRE, you can see those areas where there's blood all light up and tell you that those are, in fact, endometriomas. All right, so that is my endometriosis case. And there was one more thing I wanted to show you for comic value. I may have mentioned that uh, I did mention that I made a chart of all the adrenal hormones. And this, you know, it wasn't when I was a medical student with, who didn't know better, right? It was actually when I was a radiology resident after having been an internist and an ER doctor, I still uh, thought it interesting enough to make a chart of it. But uh, this is part of a presentation I do on presentations. And one of the little tidbits of advice I give is don't try to do your own art. So this stuff dates back, you know, almost 30 years to the first time I got a computer and I decided that I would make computerized study sheets. And that is how I would learn to use a computer. And because, you know, my generation, we didn't grow up with this stuff, right? It's not second nature. So I had to learn how to use a computer and I figured the way I would do it is make study sheets uh, with 
my computer. So if you want to take a picture of this, you're welcome to. This is my radiology physics review all on one sheet. And it flows from the top left around and back to the bottom left. Uh, so that's kind of cute. I don't know any of it anymore. There's my adrenal <laughs> chart. So yeah, I was really into it. See, I color coded the arrows for the enzyme that affect the tradition, uh, the transition from each of these substrates. Uh, and then this was my temporal bone study sheet, uh, which I showed to my neuroradiology attending. And I said, what do you think? And he, he kind of squinted at it and he said, it is highly stylized. So <laughs> I don't think he was impressed. So anyway, that's my advice. If you're ever giving presentations in the future, don't do your own art. Hire a professional. All right, so let's go on and we'll finish my curriculum on thoracoabdominal imaging, and then we'll get to your choice of uh, second half stuff. Okay, so we quit with ovarian torsion last time, and so we will pick up with a tubal torsion. So I don't know how you say that this is a torsed tube. Our radiologist who saw this is one of the best, and she nailed this. And uh, through this and saved me a lot of effort in that she always throws in path slash operative proven. So they did go in and find a torus tube here. Now, certainly you would call this a dilated tube, a hydrosalpinx at the very least. Uh, but specifically why we know it's torus, well, you'll see it does a funny loop. And there's nothing else here, right? There isn't associated uh, ovarian fluid collections or the tethering that we've seen with endometriosis. There is nothing else here besides just a torsed or a dilated tube. And so our radiologist made the leap and said, this is a tubal torsion. So it's a torsion that just involves the tube and not the ovary. And there you can see that appearance of a tubular structure on cross-sectional imaging. So there it is, you can follow it right to the corneal region. And again, the, the distal portion of the tube, the one nearest the ovary, is the portion that always dilates the most. So there it is on the axial, and here it is on the coronal. So when you see a hydrosalpinx like this, you don't see anything to suggest endometriosis or a larger scale pelvic infection. At least think of a tubal torsion, especially in the setting of an acute presentation. So that is an operative proven tubal torsion. All right, this one is wild. And you, I, I actually have several of these cases, if you can believe it. It's becoming a more and more common phenomenon. So this is ovarian hyperstimulation, and these are the ovaries here in the uh, high in the pelvis. And they're just massively expanded, hypodense, with multiple large maturing follicles. And this is the consequence usually of fertility treatments. So you can see those are both ovaries, the left and the right, and they're so big, they're just uh, uh, pressing up against each other there. So this is hormonal treatments for, um, for uh, fertility purposes. And that's the most common setting you'll see. I have one. The reason I didn't show it is it looks just the same because unfortunately the CT was post-operative. But I have one of these cases that was the presentation of a hydatidiform mole that was hormonally active and had produced uh, so much estrogen, progesterone, HCG, who knows, uh, that the ovaries were gigantic and looked just like this. So keep in the back of your mind, it can be an endogenous source of hormone as well as exogenous. But in a patient with fertility treatment history, uh, this is easy enough. This is uh, just straightforward ovarian hyperstimulation.
I didn't put any arrows or circles on these ovaries because if you can't find those, you're in trouble. All right, so that is ovarian hyperstimulation. 